Amen. May we please bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our most gracious eternal Father, we want to return thanksgiving again to you tonight for this privilege that we have to be in your house. We thank you for your grace that has been the help of your children in all their activities today. Some went to work, some were in journey. And Lord, and many others in different occupations. But by your mercy and grace, you have assembled our feet here tonight. We pray for a spiritual refreshment, O oh God. We pray, Lord, that you will accept our worship. You will accept our praises. If there be anything tonight between our soul and the Savior, we place them under the blood. That the blood that speak better things than those of Abel will speak on our behalf. We'll speak pardon, we speak cleansing, O oh God. Father, accept our offering and accept our person. As we go into thy word, may you come by in your own way. Break the bread of life for us. Give us things that will take us deeper in your love and higher in your joy. That will create a surround of your Holy Spirit and do wonderful things among us. Bless our heart master. And if there be saints that are still coming on their ways, in journeys and so forth, may you undertake for them. As we thank you for those who arrived in safely. And if there be those who are still in their houses, may you give them a quickening, O oh God. Other places where believers are fellowshipping tonight, may your unfailing presence that is with us also abide with them. Take glory in our gathering so much that when all shall be over, we would have cause to give you praise. We shall give you glory. All the programs that lay ahead of us, the weddings, the weekend services, may you give success. May you make a way, may you bless. Do it for us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, church. Amen. It's a privilege to be back again in your midst. Greetings from Arizona and Minnesota. God bless you. All right, so I don't keep you standing. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Revelations, chapter 20. Revelations, chapter 20. We welcome all travelers. You are welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. From Canada, from uh, Tennessee, from North Carolina, and all the places, believers and God's children have come. You are welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I saw the contingents from Canada. They, they told me they sent greetings. So I'm transferring the greetings they passed to the church. Amen. God bless everyone. Amen. Revelations chapter 20. <clears throat> It's the background to our study on the future home. And uh, we trust that the Lord will take us through for as long as he can. Amen. Amen. Revelations 20 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that whole serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beasts, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he, the hard part in the first resurrection. On such, 
the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four, corner, four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. And I saw a great, a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we are taking our seats, I want us to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you are there, say amen. amen. Uh, I'll read from the 13th verse. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Amen. Amen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. May the Lord add his blessings again amen. to the reading of his holy word. Amen. amen. Can we say a louder amen? Amen. We're not having a funeral service tonight. Amen. Amen. Uh, we, most of us are accustomed to that scriptures only during funeral. Uh, but it's actually not a funeral scripture like that. It's a scripture to comfort the bride. Amen. It's a scripture that tells of the hope that maketh not a shame. Amen. It's a scripture that shows to us why we are who we are. And uh, why... Uh, why we are Christians, it gives us a hope of something to come. So may the Lord help us as we navigate through his word uh, this season in the name of Jesus Christ. So like I told us, we'll be dedicating a message uh, to the memory of our pastor uh, here. And uh, I called it Future Home, like I told us the last time. But before we go into the future home proper, or let me say part A of it, we'll be speaking on events that will lead to the future home. 
And that was why instead of reading Revelations 21 tonight, which the prophet read uh, as part of the scriptures for his teaching on the future home, I read Revelations 20. Because there are some events that will lead us into the future home. Amen. Amen. So those are the things we'll be talking about tonight. And uh, uh, we congratulate the couple in waiting. And uh, we trust that the Lord will bless your day. Amen. Amen. And I think uh, maybe after service, there will be briefing on practice and all the other events that will lead to Saturday. So the Lord will give us good success. Amen. God bless you and congratulations. Amen. And uh, for those who have come from out of town, we congratulate you. I suppose your mother is here. Your mom is here tonight. Is she? Ah, God bless you, ma. You are welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're so glad to have you. And all the folks that are here, amen. God bless all of you. Amen. We're so glad to have you. Congratulations. It's a thing of joy. And the Lord will bless that joy mightily. Uh, their home will be established upon the eternal rock of ages. The Lord will fight their battles. The Lord will meet their needs. The Lord will give them seeds as their soul desire. Amen. When we try to pray for them nowadays, they caution us. Yeah, because I like to pray that the Lord will send plenty. But they keep cautioning us that let's, let's say God give them according to their desires. Yeah. Sister Confidence, isn't that right? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, Sister Indigo, God bless you. Uh, I think uh, the husband is not, hasn't yet arrived. Or is he in tonight? All right. The Lord will make a way for him. God bless everyone. All right. So, we'll be speaking on events leading to the future home, or event leading to eternity. Now, from the scripture we read in 1 Thessalonians, that is the building background to uh, all other events. The scripture told us in 1 Thessalonians about the coming of the Lord. And uh, by the revelation of God for this hour, we understand the coming of the Lord from different light, like the world will take it. As a matter of fact, by the time we run through this passage, you will realize that we are already in the coming of the Lord. Because the Bible said, the Lord will descend. For him to come, it's going to be a dissension. And I want you to know that the dissension is gradual dissension. So the coming of the Lord is going to be a process or it's going to be in stages. It's not going to be one fell sweep something. So it said the Lord will descend with a shout, with the voice and with the trump, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of the Lord. Amen. So Christ in his coming is coming with three things. First, with a shout. Second, with the voice of the archangel. And third, with the trump of the Lord. The shout, it's a message to gather the living. Uh, you see, I'm trying not to be too expansive, lest I fail to finish the subject before I leave the U.S. But <laughs> if I did not finish it, God will anoint the minister here, to continue from there. But we need to get it in the light of God's revelation as much as we can. So I'll be very patient. So the shout is the message for the living. The voice of the archangel is the message for those who passed on in Christ. And the trump is the message but both the living and the resurrected saints. So that is how the coming of the Lord is going to be. Now, when Christ, our Lord, was here, he had a three-phase ministry. I need to get this background in order to bring it to today. The first phase ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ was healing ministry, wherein he went about, the Bible said he went about doing good. He went about Anywhere there is a need, there is a sick, there is an afflicted, he meets their conditions. He was performing miracles. He was doing signs and wonders. 
And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can still do what he did before, and he's still in that business. Meaning that if I'm sick tonight, I can still get my healing. If I'm needy, I can still have him provide. Whatever you have need of, Christ is still alive to do everything that we have need of. He may not always give us our wants, but we have a security that he will give us our need. Hallelujah. So that was the first phase of his ministry. The second phase of his ministry, when it moved higher, was when he began to tell the secrets of the art in the context of being a Messiah. Amen. Amen. I have my reason for explaining it that way. In the, because there are so many people who maybe God can even show things about people's life. Maybe by way of vision, by way of trance, by way of some certain revelation. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a gift that is unique and peculiar only to the Messiah. Amen. Amen. No other person can claim that ministry or can claim that gift. Anybody who does outside of the Messiah is an impersonator. I want you to get it very well. Because it is called the sign by which Messiah is known. So it's a messianic gift. And uh, it works as discernment. The ability to tell the secret of a man's life right from the thought of his heart to the things that he has done, even to what he wants to do. It can be played out live before him. If he changes his house address yesterday and it comes to God tonight, that gift will never make a mistake in terms of calling out his house address. Say, Brother Kinsley, you come from so, so, so. You come from, and the address he's going to call will be the address that he has just changed to yesterday. He wouldn't say, oh, I'm sorry. It was your old address I'm calling. The, this Messianic gift is not a gift you cultivate. It's not a gift that you are reared up, you are trained up, and bring to perfection. There's nothing like that. If that was the way Christ was, it would be an ordinary prophet or an ordinary preacher. But Christ was a God prophet. So this gift must eat the ground running, and from its beginning to the end, it must be error-free. We've seen people today who claim they have such a gift, and the gift is missing the mark here and there. They say, you know, pray for us. It's just a gift we are trying to cultivate. That is where the mistake is. You imagine Christ coming here and man operating that gift and he's missing it. Would we accept him as Christ? We are not going to accept him. So that means this gift has no childhood beginning or adult life. It comes fully as an adult and is perfect from the beginning to the end. That is why you can challenge Christ throughout the scripture. He never missed one target. When he came before Nathaniel, he said, An Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel says, uh, Master, where did you know me? He said, Why you were under the oak tree? Whatever he was doing, he must have told him under the oak tree. And before Philip came for you there, I already saw you. Ah, he said, My Lord and my Master. So by that sign, he identified Christ. For who he was. And one day, he met another woman by the well. And he said, go call your husband. You know, she kept talking with that woman, give me water. And the woman said, this is your water business. You, uh, you are a Jew. He looks to him like a Jew. He, she, he looks to her like a Jew. Say you are a Jew. And uh, me, I'm a Samaritan. You know, normally we don't have anything in common. When those people do not have things in common, get to talking to each other, there must be something suspicious. Mr. Man, you better go straight to the point. She could think like that because that is orientation. The Bible called her a prostitute. That's her life. So every conversation strikes her like a customer coming for her. But Christ never bothered. Christ kept talking to her until she contacted her spirit and said, go call your husband. He said, me, I don't have husband. He said, yes, you have had five. And the one you are with now is not even yours. Oh! 
This thing you've just done, we were told in the church that when Messiah comes, it's Messiah that will do this. What am I trying to show you, church? Is a sign by which Messiah is identified. Amen. So that sign by which Messiah is identified, it's only peculiar to the Messiah. And I have my reason for saying that, for stressing it. Because many are claiming such a gift today. But it is wrong. Even the prophet said, there will only be one. And we receive that one in the person of Christ. Yeah. Don't worry, relax. Some of you might be thinking, are you taking the prophet out of the equation? You will see where the prophet comes into the equation now. But when Christ our Lord was manifesting this gift, he manifested in his earthly ministry only to two races of mankind, the Jews and the Samaritans. He left out the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, he was careful to do anything for the Gentile. He even told his disciples, he said, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Would that be because he wasn't mindful of the Gentiles? No. God has his divine program. And he works according to his program. His program was for the Gentile to come to him by death, burial, and resurrection. That is our appointed season. That is when it will take a hold. That was why when the Greeks, when they were incensant in their demand to see Jesus, at a point, their, you know, their desire came to a climax. Even the disciples knew that that day, this particular day that the Bible so recorded, that if they do not allow these people to see Christ, there will be trouble today. Because they came determined, says we will see Jesus. They asked over, Andrew told Philip, or Philip told Andrew, and Andrew went to Christ. So, sir, these people we have been fencing off all this while, it's like today, they mean business. I, I think it would just be better for you to come and see them. <laughs> and, uh, but the response of Jesus looked odd or shocking. He said, ah, the hour has what? Come. So when the Gentile began to hunger for the Messiah, the Messiah shouted, the hour has come. So if you were the disciple standing there that day, what would you tell Christ? Say, Master, we say some people want to see you. You say the hour has come. What has it got to do with the Father they want to see you? But that was the real answer. Then Jesus said, except the corn of wheat dies and is buried and it comes up, it will abide only by itself. What he was telling them was that when the Gentile begin to hunger to see me, it is time for my death, burial, and resurrection. Because it is only by that that the blessings that went to the Jews and the Samaritans could come to the Gentiles. You love him tonight. So this sign of the Messiah wasn't shown to the Gentiles. I will come to it. Let's continue. Anyway, anyhow, Jesus showed it, but while he was showing this messianic sign and he was doing the healing, that was not actually his message. There were attractions for his what? For his message. There are signs that went ahead before the voice. The first pull, which was the healing, the second pool, which was the healing, we use the word pools because the prophet, God showed the prophet the matters of the kingdom, the bringing in of the children of God uh, in a fishing manner. And he said, if you want to catch a fish, you will put on your hook, you will put the leo or the bait on the hook. You don't allow the fish to see the hook. You project the bait. But you project the bait in a manner that if the fish picks the bait, it gets the hook. Yes. Are you catching it? Yes. And he said, when you go to fishing, God was teaching him. He said, if you feel the first tug, how many are fishers here? Fish how many? I've fished a few times. Amen? All right, Brushen is a fisherman, so he can relate with what I'm saying. 
Uh, your wife is saying you're fishing. <laughs> it's cat fishing. <laughs> All right, whatever fish is fishing, anyhow. Praise the Lord. All right, so uh, when you feel the first bite of the fish, you don't jack your hook. When you feel it, you just pull a little and keep the hook natural as if the hook is being tossed by the current. The fish understands the tossing of the current. But if you, if you jack it too sudden, the fish will suspect and say, ah, this is unnatural. Jacking too fast is unnatural to the fish. But it knows when it is natural. So that is your first pull. You allow the fish to get a small bite and start building confidence that everything is safe. Are you catching it? So when it gets the second one, pew, you pull a little again. And you pull in a manner to allow the ocean currents determine the movement of the bait. That is the second pull. If the fish is able to do that twice and still see the bait floating naturally or moving naturally, it will have the confidence to swallow everything. So when it swallows it, the hook gets the right place in there, then give it the third pull. And you get the fish out of the water. Of course, while you are pulling, it's struggling. No matter how big it is, just keep pulling. Just keep rolling your hook. That is, the guy is already hooked. He must land into your boat. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the way to do the fishing. So God used that to explain to the prophets, the ministry, that that is how every true child or true children of God comes into the kingdom. You offer first signs which was why God offered the healing to create an attraction. Now, in this attraction, it is not only the fish that is usually attracted. All kind of water creatures are usually attracted. But the interest of the fisherman is the fish. So the signs will pull all kinds. The first pull brought all kind of people. You saw even people who wanted to make Jesus the king. Before the time. Jesus withdrew from among them. He got a boat and went to the other side. They chartered boats. See how much money they will have spent for the gospel. And they went to look for him on the other side and said, compulsorily, we must make you our king. And the Bible said, they were not doing all these things because of his word. It's there in your Bible. But they are doing it because of the miracles, signs and wonders. They were so excited. They were happy. Because signs attract all kinds. So when God stepped it up by bringing messianic discernment, which was the second sign, it attracted even larger crowds. But those things, you know, gather all kinds. It is only the word that gets the blight out of the crowd. So after all these people have been attracted and the confidence of Christ has been established in them, as a true Messiah, as a true healer, as the man sent from God. They said, in fact, never does anybody, never have we seen this before. Then the Bible said, it began to sound his message. Amen. That message that it began to sound was his shout. Are we here? Yes. The shout was not the first pull. The shout was not the second. The shout was the message that brought out the bride, the real believers, out of the congregation that we are masked by the wonderful signs and wonders. That is the shout. Amen. Now, I'm using that as a background to the scripture we read in 1 Thessalonians because you remember the scripture we read in 1 Thessalonians was given after Christ had come and gone. Yeah. Are you catching it? But when you understand the ministry of Christ, you'll be able to understand it when we brought it back in these last days. So in these last days, this is the Gentile era. Because the scripture told us in the book of Acts that after Christ left, the disciples he commissioned were to carry the message on among the Jews, the Samaritans, the Israelites. But it came to a point that they kept resisting that truth. And Apostle Paul, the Bible says, he works bold. 
It was in the spirit. And he said, it was necessary that the gospel ought to have been first preached unto you. But because you all counted yourself unworthy of this only thing, what do we do? Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles began to have their time right after Pentecost. Are you following me? Yeah. And this time of the Gentiles, we run from right after Pentecost till this coming of the Lord we are talking about. God does not deal with the Gentiles and the Jews at the same time. <clears throat> this is the reason today Apostle Paul said blindness in part has gone to the Jews. Till now, the Jews are still blind. Israel today is not a Christian nation. <laughs> That's strange. It's not a Christian nation. It's a nation of Judaism religion. Because Christian means to be Christ-like. Israel of today denied Christ. If you go there today, they said you're Christ. It is not their Christ. Though in the providence of God, God has also designed that some Israelites will accept Christ during the Gentile era. Such, uh, you know, in the same manner, some Gentiles, amen, accepted Christ and even enjoyed outstanding miracles. Even though it was not meant for them initially. Do you realize that? As a matter of fact, Christ commended the unusual faith of the Gentiles. He said it was among the Gentiles that he has not seen some unique faith. That, uh, that, that he saw some unique faith that he never saw among the Jews. Remember the centurion. He said, I have never seen such a faith in Israel. Amen. And yet it wasn't the Gentile era. But there were radical Gentiles, amen, who were valiant in faith and broke through every barrier to receive their blessing. Amen. Look at that Syrophoenician woman. Yeah. Jesus even said, I am not sent to your race. Yeah. Amen. He made it clear to him. Yeah. And he called his race dogs. Yeah. And the sister said, excuse me, sir. He said, there is nothing <laughs> that is going to stop me from receiving my blessing. Yeah. No amount of insult. No amount of complexes. No amount of derogation. I must get this. My daughter's life is at stake. He says, sir, I agree with you. We are dogs. No problem. But see, even dogs are not left out of the booties of the master. If they can't eat on the table, they eat the crumbs under the floor. Ah, Jesus said, this woman run a ring around me. He said, he turned to the people. He said, you see, I haven't seen such a thing. I mean, we even tried to annoy her. And she refused to be annoyed. Amen. Gentiles, are you here? Amen. Gentiles, are you here? Amen. You love him tonight. Amen. So in those things are in God's providence like that. There will be certain sacred little, little exceptions. But in that time, it was meant for the Jews. After Pentecost, because Pentecost took place after death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the gospel came to the Gentiles. Amen. And it will be with us to conclude both the time and the fullness of the Gentiles by way of the rapture. So it is our season. But I'd like to tell the Gentiles tonight that your season is winding up. Because this same gospel that is with us is going to go back. They were blinded for our sake. Amen. Those eyes that were blinded will be opened again. That was why in 1946 to 1948, God fulfilled the prophet of Isaiah and Ezekiel. He actually took back the Jews on the wings of eagle. The prophets then were seeing aeroplanes in the vision, but they had no better way to describe it. He said, I saw Israel returned on the wings of the eagle. And they have returned and formed a formidable nation today. Out of the nation that is standing there, 144,000. 12,000 for each tribe. There may not be any tribal record again, but God knows each person. He said the seal of God standeth sure that the Lord knoweth those who are his. Amen. So from each tribe, 12,000 is going to be sealed by the ministry of Moses and Elijah. Who is going to preach the revelation of Jesus Christ and brought back the truth of the Messiah. And that truth is going to purge 144,000 people and bring them to an atonement to realize that the Messiah we rejected was actually Christ. 
Amen. Amen. And that will bring a feast of atonement that will seal the 144,000. Amen. Amen. Who will join us in the millennium journey and thereafter. Amen. Amen. So we we'll take a pause on them like that. Now, since the Gentiles were not attended to by the first coming of Christ, the reason I've brought this background is to give you an understanding of what is going to happen with us now. I could take time, I've been reading them, but I know it's not going to be boring, but I want to be using simple languages so that little ones also can get it, and so that we can have a flow, and we do it very fast. I hope you're enjoying the Lord. Yeah. So, the Gentiles that were not considered them, God decides that the appointed season will be by his death, burial, and resurrection. And as the Gentile era comes to a climax, God is going to send his pure word again as he did in the beginning. Let's take an history with the Gentile church. When the Gentile dispensation began, God sent to them a messenger that has a prophetic grace. Now, this prophetic grace will be a prophetic realm in the sense that the word of the Lord will come to him for the Gentiles. Are you following me? And that is why we have a man called Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was not just an ordinary missionary. He was a prophet messenger. The one to whom the revelation of God for the hour must come. Now, when Christ preached, he preached to the Jews. The full revelation of the gospel of Christ must be brought to the Gentiles. It wasn't Peter God used. God used Peter to open all the doors, both for the Jews and the Gentiles. Remember, he was the one who has the keys to the kingdom. So he's the man, he was the man who unlocked everywhere. Amen. Right from the house of Cornelius. You remember, that was where it began. For the first time, the Gentile received the Holy Ghost by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Peter said, ah, it is a case of I have never seen this before. Because the perfect order is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But because the Gentiles, there is a special thing about the Gentiles. Who, they were hearing the gospel for the first time. Don't forget. God sent by the vision, Cornelius sent for this man. He's dwelling in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives around Joppa. Bring him, he will teach you what to do. Meaning that that kind of gospel they have never had before. The best in terms of gospel outside of the Old Testament doctrine that any man has had was John the Baptist's teaching. Which brought them as far as to repentance and nothing more. But this message of Christ is to bring them to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So it's not something they have had before. But here was the, you know, the Apostle Peter who came and he said, well, he didn't even know how everything happened. He said, well, this is how I am led here uh, and I'm glad you people are set to hear the word. This man was preaching the gospel, not with the whole of his heart. He was preaching the gospel while looking back. You know why? He was bottled and he was caged by the prejudice of the Jews. Mm. So it wasn't even the gospel that, comes, that came completely out of a free mind, free art. Read your Bible. He was concerned so much about what the Jewish brethren would say. Because, but you see, he was also bound by the vision he saw. Uh, uh, God showed him vision of all kinds of things. And the Lord told him, rise up, all kind of animals. He said, rise up and eat. He said, I've never touched anything unclean. I have never in my life, and God, you can testify. God said, yes. But what I call clean, don't call unclean. God was trying to rise him above their prejudice against the Gentiles. Because as far as the Jew is concerned, the Gentiles look like an outcast. And God was trying to change his mindset his orientation, so as to prepare him with a free heart to preach that gospel. But even when he got there preaching, he was mindful of what his brethren, when they hear what they were going to say. 
But these Gentiles, whether you are giving them the gospel out of whatever, Gentiles are very special. And God has got to do something radical among them in order to break the prejudice of the Jews. So with the little they were airing, with the way it was coming, whether half-hearted or all-hearted, the Gentiles were connecting until God became excited. He broke his own protocol. <laughs> In their hearts, they were repenting, they were accepting the word, but they have not been baptized, and yet they received the Holy Ghost. Hey, it humbled the preacher himself now. He said, now we can see that God is no respecter. You know, that came out of a heart that has something. He said, now we can see. God has to, I won't say humiliate his children. God does not humiliate his children. But he humbled that preacher. Now, you see, uh, what looks like a big deal to you, see what I have done. Right before you, I filled these people with the Holy Ghost. He said, now, can anybody forbid water? Do you know, despite all those supernaturals, whether some people hear the truth or they didn't get the detail, they were waiting to deal with Peter in Jerusalem. So, did you hear what Apostle Peter did? We remove him from being the bishop in Jerusalem. He's not going to pass to our church here. He's gone to the Gentiles. And when he came, he said, excuse me, brethren. Listen, 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 listen. All this is your stuff, church. You better pull it down. This was what happened. Life in my presence. Everybody said, if God has reckoned with the Gentile that way, then what are we to do? What was God doing? God was using Apostle Peter to unlock the heavenly key, the heavenly kingdom door to the Gentiles. And when that became unlocked, Paul came and took it over. He told the Jewish brethren, he said, the gospel was necessary to have been preached to you before, but because you guys counted yourself unworthy, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. He could freely turn to the Gentiles because the gates to the kingdom has been opened for the Gentile church. Amen. You love him tonight. Amen. So when this gate became open, Paul became its first messenger. Being the first messenger, he wasn't just an ordinary messenger. He was a prophet messenger. Amen. And you love to understand that because the word of the Lord the pure revelation for the gent of Christ, for the Gentile church, came through that man. So we are not talking of him just a prophet in the sense of seeing vision. That's not what I'm talking. He saw visions, no doubt. But we are talking of him in the sense that the revelation of the word for the hour came to him. And that was why Paul could say to the church, if we or any other angel <laughs> come to you and tell you otherwise than this that we have taught. Paul was saying that when God gives a revelation, it remains a final revelation. He cannot alter it. He can give things that can further enhance our understanding of the same revelation, but he can never change his word. So he said, if we or any other come and tell you otherwise than what we have taught, let it be an angel from heaven or earth. Let him be our cause. He said, I said it the first time and I say it again. That is why Paul could say, that which I received from the Lord, the same I delivered to the church. That is why Paul could say, when it pleased God in due season, he brought me out to reveal his son. Amen. Amen. So Paul brought the revelation of the son of man Amen. to the Gentile church. And that was why Paul could say, follow me as I follow Christ. Those statements was, were too outstanding for an ordinary minister, for an ordinary person to make. It's because of the position Paul occupied. Then Brother Bram said, he became the standard that every other messenger will be benchmarked by. Are you following? Amen. Praise God. Is that clear to that extent? You see the basis for all these things as we go along. That is why I said I will not do rush, rush, or patch up job because we're, we're establishing the brethren. Amen. Amen. So, but after Paul came, instead of the things queuing higher, it began to drop. Before Paul left, he saw the possibility of it being, of dropping and he began to warn the church. 
The grievous wolves. How many read that in the scripture? Those things were not written for nothing. We thank God for the message of the hour that has anointed our eyes with the eyes of God to pick those revelations. He said, grievous wolves will come among you. And he told us also that the mystery of iniquity has already started work and is being revealed. What is the essence of the mystery of iniquity? Is to make a spiritual church turn to a carnal church. Yeah. Amen. And the way to produce a carnal church is to pervert the word. Right. So the perversion of the pure word had started right even before Paul left. So that was why Paul, the standard, after Paul left, it began to drop. Are you catching it? Then Irenaeus came and held to that which is remained and was militant. And, you know, he faced organization like a no man's business because that was when an attempt began to start replacing the truth with ideas and the structures of men. What God wants the church to be kept by is by his own conduct, his own order, his own doctrine. That is the word of the Lord. But men began to introduce their ideas. Do you know that even in the Old Testament, if you don't keep the order, the structure God left, you can't be victorious. That's right. That's right. You can't have a revival. No I, was it here I told you the other time or somewhere else? I said, putting the Ark of the Covenant on a new cart by David was not a new thing. It was here I said it. God bless you. The Philistines have done it, and it worked for them. And they did it by a divine revelation through their own ministers. Amen. But that's not the covenant for the elect of that hour. It worked for them. David trying to copy them. I said it's like the believer trying to copy Pentecostals in order to bring a revival. It's not going to work. Instead of producing life, it produced death. Are you catching it? And read your scripture for that. Few chapters after, do you know that thing delayed that great revival for about 20 years? It's in the Bible. Everything just went down. After 20 years, when they heard that the house of, Bebe, of Obedidom, where the ark of God was kept, was being blessed, was prospering, because those people have respect for the presence of God in their homes. So they started prospering. God help us to have respect for this glorious message, for this glorious word in our homes, in our lives, in our church. It meant prosperity, healing, and blessing. David said, ah, it mustn't be that family alone that will be enjoying. Let us go and bring the ark now. Now watch what David said. David began to tell the people. He said, you know why we failed? Because we never sought to bring it after the due order. That was exactly his language. So there's a due order. Oh, my. There's a what? Due order. So that order can never be old-fashioned. Amen. It is the mind and the will of the Lord. If we do not follow it, we are working for death. If we follow it, we are working for life, for abundance, for healing, for prosperity, for victory. Hallelujah. And for blessings of the heavenly places. May God give us understanding. Abijah defeated Jeroboam by due order. Read your Bible. Abijah was the grandson of Solomon. When Jeroboam brought war, Jeroboam was coming with 800,000 soldiers. Abijah of Judah only had 400,000, my brother. But when Abijah saw that he was outnumbered, he came out. <laughs> he said, Jeroboam and Israel, listen to me. The kingdom was given to my father David by the covenant of salt. Salt is a preserver, meaning that this covenant cannot decay, cannot perish. God will watch over it to perform it all the time. It's everlasting covenant. That is why when we get to the millennium, we are still going to be governed by the throne of David. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, so don't fight whom the Lord has blessed. He said, but watch, before you fight, consider this. Jeroboam has destroyed the order of the Lord. He has removed the priest. He has instituted worship that is contrary. He said, but as for us, we have God's order. We have the priests in their places. We have the elements. We have the, this one. We have that one. He said, by this, we have the presence of God. Amen. 
when we follow due order, we do what? Have the presence of God. And we can be ready for victory. You love him? So let nobody sell any idea to you. It is a strange fire. Korah, Dathan, and Habiram were destroyed because they offered what? Strange fire. When they said, oh my, it's just coming this way. God help us. Amen. Amen. When they said, they told, uh, they, told his, uh, they told Moses, you take too much to yourself. If you think you are holy, the congregation is also holy. If you think God speaks to you, God speaks to us also. Whatever you can claim. And look, let me tell you, really, in terms of preaching, they have better delivery. <laughs> because Moses, Moses is a preacher of boredom. He doesn't get his water very well. So the church will lose interest. But when Korah, Dathan, and Abraham come, oh, in the junction of the pyramid, connecting with the revelation, in the cancellation of the seven angels, the church will be jumping. <laughs> so who is, who is more interesting? So they took advantage of that. <laughs> but let me tell you, even if all Moses could say is, ah, 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 that is the person that carries... <laughs> the program of God, the redemption of God for that hour. I'm building it to this age coming, friends. You love him? All right. So, so let's come back to this so that we don't go. So this thing began to drop, drop. And it dropped until the edges of the church went into the dark era. The dark ages means Man's idea became enthroned over the word of God. The little light you will see is the little word that is left. You know why? Because no matter how bad a season is, God must still have a witness. But you know, thank you. I have got spiritual people here tonight. But you know, it could be so bad until you feel alone. Until you think you are the only one left. And we are in the age of apostasy. Where everything is falling apart. Men's hearts are failing for fear. You can't even trust people's life again. Their confession is not holding true again. It's hypocrisy everywhere. It's malice, complex. People are not standing right. I tell you, it could run so bad until you think you are all alone. He did for Elijah. He said, God, I'm the... He didn't want to live again because he was feeling the pangs of loneliness. He said, I'm not better than my father's. I've not worked other than them. I've not been more spiritual than them. I beg, I beg, it's over. Let me go. <laughs> God said, calm down, boy. God must have blown some breezes of comfort to him. He said, you want to hear the truth, Elijah? I have 7,000. Oh, church. In their little, little corners. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've got 7,000 who haven't bowed down to bow. Elijah said, really? He said, really? Really? Very sure. If you want me to mention each of them and their location for you, I will tell you, Elijah, you are not alone. Because no matter how bad the season is, no matter how bad an institution is, God must have a witness. For the white throne judgment to stand justice, God must plant his witnesses everywhere. And that is why you are here, church, because you are his witnesses. When we come to the judgment throne, it is your word, your testimony against the unbeliever that judges them. Don't always forget that. Let that give you the impetus, the motivation to live right all the time. And if we are not measuring up right, let this pour our hearts to prayer so that we can come to victory. Praise God. You love him. So, it went so down. Then God started bringing because God took it like a seed planted. Eh? That rotted in what? In the soil. Mm -hmm. And it's got to die and rotten in the soil in order to bring life. Eh? So if it must live again, it must die and rotten. So God took it for that as an experience of the Gentile dispensation. And it started a little shoot of life from all of the ground of darkness in Martin Luther. But these folks that came after Paul, they were not actually the bringer of the word. Mm. So they are not prophet messenger in themselves. They are messengers. But they are not messenger in the sense of bringing the revelation for the hour. 
What God used them to do is to sustain a portion of light. That is why, you see, if you don't, if the church does not get this very well, you will run into the critics today who are trying to make mice meat of the message, but with dark understanding. God knows what he's doing. Somebody once said that if the prophet was right, he wouldn't put somebody like Martin Luther as a messenger. And the prophet was all right. <laughs> Because he never told you Martin Luther was a prophet messenger who can bring error free doctrine. He told you he's a reformer. You understand? And that if you follow the law of creation, that tells you that when you begin to have the restoration of life, it comes like a little shoot. Amen. That could be a mighty oak tree. Everything it will take to make an oak is right in that shoot. But you don't get the oak as a shoot. So Luther never brought the entire light. God gave him just a little light. And he brought justification. The just shall live by faith. With that grace, he did what many a people couldn't do. Challenging the Pope and the structure of Catholicism and the emperor of the earth and getting by with it because it was the move of God. Are you getting it? Then up comes Wesley after him with a further light of sanctification. Then up come the Pentecostals with the restoration of the gift and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for Brother William Samuel. They call him the one high Negro. It's fine, but what what stood out for us was God used him to bring a revival of restoration. But you see, the revival of restoration that produces the birth, it's only the beginning of life in physical manifestation. Uh Amen. Amen. A pregnant sister carried life within her. Uh Is that right? We know a life is coming by the protrusion, Uh but we have not seen the life. Uh Amen. Until that life is expelled as a baby, then the expelled baby becomes the fresh beginning of life manifested on earth. Is that right? Now, birth is not the end to it. It is actually the beginning of life. Are you catching it? So for that life not to become stunted, somebody can be born and become stunted growth. He can be attacked by kwashioko, and the growth becomes abnormal. But for there to be a perfect birth, there must be a complete restoration of all the nutrients that will form a balanced diet. This was why after the Pentecostal Reviver, Azusa Reviver, God must bring a messenger on the scene. Who will bring an end to a Pentecostal age? Are you following? Laodicean age, the last dispensation of the Gentile, uh, of the Gentile era, started as a Pentecostal age. But so a messenger must appear at the end of that Pentecostal age in order to bring total restoration of everything that is needed to produce growth, maturity, and adoption. Mm. Are we together, church? If you're in backsliding condition, I want you back home in the house of the Lord. Because this is your deliverance. It doesn't get better elsewhere. You say, why are you talking like that? I'm talking like Apostle Paul. Paul said, if you want to have Christ, follow me. And if you want to have Christ today, follow the messenger. I'm going to introduce him to you in case you don't know him. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. For this man to be able to bring, for this messenger to be able to bring a complete restoration, he must be given all the articles of the entire world to prepare the Gentiles. What you have been having is building block of the Gentiles. The Gentile must come to a climax by their cream. That is why the Bible says, they without us. There is no completion. There is no perfection. Now, all through this Gentile dispensation, you never see any of the Gentile messengers showing the sign of the Messiah. Did you see that? Read profane history, read religious history. There was none like that. 
Because God deposited, God kept that for the time that the cream of the Gentile bride, the capstone of the Gentiles. You see why I'm happy to come in this season? <laughs> you call Laodicea a bad season. It is the best season. If God would give us another chance, I don't want to come in Ephesians. I don't want to come in Smyrna. I want to come again in this Laodicea. Because we will bring the perfection to the entire body of Christ. Are you catching it? So God must send a messenger again to bring the fullness of the ministry of Christ. Because that is the only thing that can produce the gentle bride. Jesus, before he left, he promised that he will be revealed again. He has come by himself. He said, but there will be a day when he, the son of man, is going to be revealed. So we search through the error. Apart from Apostle Paul, who gave us an hint that God was pleased to reveal his son in him. When everything went down into darkness and started coming back, nobody ever claimed to have the full revelation of the son of man. But there must be the full revelation of the son of man in order for the gentle bride to be ripened and prepared for perfection. So if that has to be, when? Now. Now. (laughs) If you are talking of the coming of the love, the physical return, the end of the Gentiles, then something must take place now. And I call your attention to this, it has taken place. This is why he sent a messenger in the last days. Amen. Amen. And he gave him He is not the Messiah. Now listen to this. But he will reveal the Messiah. The sign by which the Messiah is known that he will bring does not belong to him. It belongs to only the Messiah. But since the Messiah himself will not be here physically to operate it for the Gentile, he was happy to bequeath it to a messenger to act on his behalf. This is why the ministry of that messenger will be the unveiling of God. (laughs) And we thank God, this day we have the mighty God unveiled before us. Are you following? He said, I was not the one that appeared at Ohio River. He never claimed to be the person of Christ. But he brought the full ministry of Christ. He said, I was only the person near. When he appeared, he said, a man is what will fail. You are not feeding on me, but you are feeding on the unfailing body watch of the Son of Man. That word word again there. Amen. Amen. So for us to have the guarantee that this is the man that will bring the total word, the word that is infallible, the Messiah must vindicate him to us. Are you catching it? That is why he gave him the two signs again. Outstanding healings like never before. Till today, all the preachers of this end time still believe that there was no person that was used as great to bring healing to the world like William Abraham. They said when the world needed real healing, after the first and the second world war, they relied on a messenger from Kentucky to bring hope back to this earth. That Kentucky man was William Brown. Glory to God. You love him tonight. All right, after which God said, I will step it higher. It shall come to a time you'll be able to tell the secret of us. All those things were to vindicate him to us that this is the man who carried the ministry of the Messiah. This is the man whose words we must listen to. And that was why God was not ashamed to come back in the halo of light. He appeared to Paul in the halo of light. The only other messenger he appeared to, and even in these last days was pleased to take a photograph with him. Right in your country here was William Abraham. Till today, the picture of the pillar of fire, praise God. Some have become ashamed in the, you know, displaying it. Thank God we are not ashamed of it here. Praise God. This picture still stands in Library of Congress. Right here, right here in Washington. I've been there twice. You've seen it. If you have not gone seen it, go see it. You you must be a testifier. You must be a true witness. 
Yes, sir. If me from Nigeria, I've seen it twice. You have no excuse not to see it once, Americans. Come on. Don't be too busy to put value on spiritual things. It's right in there. Amen. The government holds proprietary uh, ownership of it because they testified it is the truth. The mechanical eye of the camera didn't take an illusion. It took a visible standing object in there. And if you believe the testimony of Moses that he saw the pillar of fire, do you believe that? Don't shame yourself now. If you believe the testimony of Paul that he saw the pillar of fire, we didn't say, nobody was there. Even the people who were there didn't see. On the day Paul saw it, but he testified to what he saw. And he said, he asked, who are thou? And the pillar of fire said, I'm Jesus Christ. If you can believe that, this is the third testimony. Why don't you believe William Abraham? And for those skeptics who will not believe, because this is the age of apostasy, God was kind to take the picture. Now, this picture wasn't taken by the believers. As a matter of fact, it was taken by the critic, by skeptics and by the agnostics. Hallelujah. And it was tried and tested by your own proud FBI that you people have confidence in. So if you don't believe our word for it, believe your FBI. Hallelujah. So the presence of God in our day was identified himself with the messenger. All, was, all he was doing is to prove that this messenger is what? Is the truth. So if he brought healings that never failed, if he brought disarmaments, messianic ones, and he only in an age can do it. It's not even his own, are you seeing my narration? It's not even his own gift. Is Messiah's gift. But is to identify Messiah to the Gentile as it was identified to the Jews and the Samaritans. Are you catching it? Because the Gentile must have their fair share. Once Messiah has become thoroughly identified, we don't need the operation of the gift again. If any man claims it today, he's an impersonator. That's why they are messing around. I have quotes that the prophet said, it's going to be only one person that is going to manifest that Messiah. He said, your pastors will not do this. Yes. Pastors, fivefold, you have your realm. But this particular realm of Messianic discernment does not belong to you. Right. Amen. If you lift yourself to a realm God has not put you, you will fall on the wrong side. And that's why they are falling like a pack of cats today. But thanks be to God. In the multitude of this fake, there is that one original. Yeah. To identify Messiah to us. So that if those signs did not fail, then we will be sure that the interpretation of the word that will come oh, uh -huh, will be perfect. It is that interpretation of the word which is the third pole that does what? That attracts the bride. That is the beginning of the coming of the Lord. The rapture for the Gentile bride. So I can safely say tonight, we're in the rapture. <laughs> because he said, it will descend with what? With a shout. The shout is not the healing, not the Mezani discernment. Because the healing and the Mezani discernment gather not only the bride. It gathers all kinds. As it did with Christ, it did in these last days. All kinds, so much that we're excited to take the world around the world, to take the prophet around the world seven times. It wasn't your money. It was the money of the Pentecostals and denominations, assemblies of God, full gospel business, oneness, twoness, threeness, united Pentecostal, and all kinds. Those were the monies, first square, that took the prophet around the world seven times. And they could go along with him just like they went along with Jesus, as long as it was in the realm of signs and wonders. But when he began to sound his message, just like Jesus Christ, they began to take offense until the crown of Jesus became 70. And the 70 couldn't even stand. It eventually became 12 minus 1. <laughs> because we have 12. But one among the 12 is still a devil. Hallelujah. So if you see the crowd thinning down in the last days, it's because we are in the coming of the Lord. If you are not meant for it, you won't be in it. If you stray inside, you will find your way. Brother Bram said, the real elect comes by the word Amen. and by the calling of God. And God calls by his word. Amen. And that word will be by ordination. 
So it is not ordinary anybody that can listen to this. It is those who are programmed for it by the seed gem of God before the foundation of the world. So when we begin to enjoy the opening of the word, we got into the rapture. And that word will be working upon the atoms of your body and be changing you from glory to glory to glory. You keep, it keeps wetting your appetite to walk in the light. Just like Enoch was walking. And he walked for 365 years. And one day, he struck the king's highway. And the rapture that has been walking on him made his body lost gravity. And he began to gravitate upwards. So shall it be one of these days. Let's leave it at that tonight. And we shall continue from there. Shalom. God bless you, saints. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Amen. A wonderful time for you. A wonderful time for me. If we are prepared to meet Jesus the King, a wonderful time it will be. A wonderful time. I think it's 40. I'm for you. Oh yes, if we are prepared to meet Jesus the King, a wonderful time it will be. Oh, a wonderful time for you, for you. A wonderful time for me. Oh yes, if we Prepare to meet Jesus, the King. A wonderful time it will be. Hallelujah! Oh, a wonderful time for you. Yes, a wonderful time for me. Oh, if we are prepared to meet Jesus, the King. Wonderful time it will be. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for opening our eyes and our hearts of understanding to know the things that we are knowing. A humble little group set apart from all the multitudes of the earth. Lord, such is your path, such is your way. O oh God, to hide these things from the eyes of the intellectuals, the wise and the prudent, but to keep it, O oh God, and reveal it to babes, such as we learn. I will thank you tonight that you've anointed our eyes with high stars to catch this glorious revelation of this hour, to see the blessings that lay ahead, the hope that make it not ashamed, the desire of all the saints through the ages, coming to climax and to fullness in our generation. What a blessed people we have. Oh God, we pray tonight that this revelation will take a hold upon every heart. Oh God, it will walk upon us indeed prosper in our lives. We don't want to be like a rocky stone in the water that will live in the abundance of water and yet you crack it, it will still be so dry because the water has not penetrated. Father, we pray, let this word penetrate. Let that word penetrate, O God. Divinely reveal mystery truth that will literally turn our hearts. Lord Jesus, let it walk upon the atoms of our bodies. Change us from glory to glory. Give us the heart to receive them. As we do, O oh God, may it knock out every sinful habit. May it cleanse our heart and prepare it for your occupation. And may you begin to take occupation, Almighty God, and flourish therein. Dear Jesus, till we shall become love, O oh God, till we shall become you on two feet, grant it is our desire. 
Oh Lord, we have a testimony that he not walked with you until he was no more sin. Oh God, may this revelation of the wonderful time continue to motivate our walk with you. Strengthen us and energize us, oh God. Never to retreat, never to surrender, never to turn our back upon you knowing that it is not him that beginneth, but he that finisheth the race. Help us one day to strike that king's highway. Oh God, we are the seventh, oh God, from the second Adam, just as Enoch was the seventh from the first Adam. So we know our age, oh God, by the type of your word, we take the rapture. We don't want to be missing, Lord. Bless these words in us. Appropriate his understanding and revelation upon every heart. Let it give such a quickening. Let it give such a blessing. Oh God, let it become our thoughts. The meditation of our heart. May we never forget them, Lord. As we go, oh God, may we brood over those things, Lord. And may they help us in our journey here below. Thank you, dear Father. We thank you for little Shalom. Oh God, uh, uh, Adelon that turned another year. Oh God, a day or two ago, we ask that your blessing will be upon her. The mother is asking that your presence will abide with her. You will grant her your protection. You will overshadow her in your love, O oh God. And as she and all our children are being kept in the atmosphere of this message, we pray to work for their salvation in their later years. Bless the little child. Bless every one of us. We want to ask, O oh God, that you will dismiss us with your blessing as we go. May you go home with us. May you uh, be our help for the programs that we have tomorrow and on Saturday. Be with your son, be with your daughter. As they come to unite, oh God, in holy matrimony, we pray that you will establish their home upon the rock of ages. Every aspect of the program, every service that we go into it, may you undertake, Lord. May you grant good success, oh God, if there be any gap. May you feel for us. Let all be well. Then we thank you for the saints, the families who have arrived. We pray for those who are still on their way that you will undertake for them. Make it a real day of joy. That on Sunday we shall look back with gladness and joy in our heart for the goodness that thou shall have done for us. Let it be there, Father. Till we gather again, may you keep us in fellowship with you and with one another. Let your blessings rest upon thy people. Heal their tiredness and refresh them. And bless their night, O God, and give to them a better tomorrow. As they wait upon you in the watches of the night, may your thought fill their heart. If there be a tomorrow in this peer our lives, that we might continue to serve you. Bless us as we go now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, saints. The Lord bless you, saints. The Lord bless you, saints. Are you happy at his goodness? That he has opened your eyes and your eyes alone to see the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom. Don't take it for granted. Treasure it and hold it tight. Amen. We welcome Brother Amos and his wife from Tennessee. God bless you. Thanks for being around with us. Brother Amos, please come over.